Look at this crushed tire, crushed with enough force to make junk out of the steel wheel. Now, we'll show you how we crushed that tire and what happened to it. You're watching a Goodyear tire made with the toughest nylon known. The 3T triple tempered nylon used only by Goodyear. Nylon so tough, we put this same tire on this New York taxi cab. In the toughest kind of driving, it will pile up mile after mile. And look at this. Although Blackwall prices on this Goodyear tire start at only $12.88 plus tax, you've only heard half the story. Like all Goodyear tires, this $12.88 nylon is turnpike proved, meaning it's also tough in the tread for mileage. Remember, for just $12.88, you can get Goodyear nylon. Goodyear's 3T nylon all weather. Why take chances? Any old tire off your car is the down payment. It's a snow tire in the winter. It's a rain tire in the fall. It's a sun tire in the summer. It's the one that does it all. Good years new TMO for all seasons, for all year. It moves through snow and ice, yet runs quiet in the clear. Tiempo is a tough double steel belted radial with a special tread design for all kinds of weather. Snow tire, rain tire, sun tire, one tire Tiempo does it all. This is a tale of courage and pluck and the do or die spirit of youth. It reads very much like fiction, but the strange part of all is the truth. For a slim blonde lad of 25 with a faith in his aeroplane decided to fly from New York to Paris. A great many fought him in vain. But off he flew, he was all alone. You had to admire his pluck. While a breathless world with a prayer on its lips wished him Godspeed and good luck. Call it courage, bravery, or downright guts. The Roaring Twenties revealed what we most valued in ourselves in an era when heroes showed no fear and at times no constraint. It's fitting that the Goodyear blimps would rise to the occasion. Symbolized by the idols of the day, Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart taking their spirit of adventure, their leap of faith, and demonstrating the ability to create a lasting legacy in the hearts and minds of the American public. America was invincible. The first world war had been won. Business was booming. People were hitting the road in record numbers and driving the success of the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Headed by a forward-thinking leader, P.W. Litchfield, Goodyear and its employees enjoyed the lion's share of the Roaring Twenties. Always an entrepreneur, Litchfield acquired the patents of the German Zeppelin Company, allowing him to secure the technology of early airship design and coax the company's chief engineer to join the newly formed Goodyear Zeppelin Company. Dr. Carl Arnstein, who would prove an invaluable player in the Goodyear blimp legacy, agreed to Litchfield's offer, bringing with him 12 German-born technical experts to continue a process of airship development that had been initiated for World War I efforts. Having a fascination for air travel and a keen sense of promotional prowess, Litchfield found ways to elevate his interests, on the ground as well as in the air. He decided that his company should have a blimp of its own, and so he commissioned the Pilgrim, Goodyear's first promotional blimp. Christened in 1925 by Litchfield's wife Florence, the Pilgrim would begin a crusade of design and display. The uh, Pilgrim was an important airship because it, uh, first of all, was the first commercial airship to use helium. But secondly, it brought about the idea of mating the car to the bottom of the bag, whereas earlier the bags had to be separately rigged from the uh, cars. It was small enough to be uh, maneuverable and but yet large enough to carry uh, at least the two passengers. The, the suspension system and technical innovations which were patented by Goodyear are still in use today. Bearing the recognizable logo, the Pilgrim was thought by Litchfield to be the first of the air yachts, non-rigid airships designed to cruise the skies as a common form of travel. To demonstrate the airship's capabilities, Litchfield had the Pilgrim drop in on this downtown Akron department store. And from the very beginning, the Goodyear blimps captured the fancy of the American public, giving them a thrill whenever they were present. 
Here, the Pilgrim, suited in holiday finery as the Santa Claus Express, decked the halls of the Springfield Sanitarium, dropping packages via parachutes to the recipients below. And every day was a celebration, or so it seemed, in this era of frivolity. In 1927, the Army and the Navy worked with Goodyear to build several free balloons. Designs once used to defend our country in World War I were now being used to defend a trophy in the Gordon Bennett National Balloon Race and test materials used in lighter-than-air flight, much in the same way Goodyear tests its tires on today's racetracks. In 1928, the Navy approached Litchfield with a need for an aircraft carrier, one that would not be a ship at sea, but a ship in the air. And, of course, Goodyear's captain responded. But in order for his company to build the great airships, first, a giant hangar called the Air Dock must be built in Akron, Ohio. From its groundbreaking on November 4, 1928, it took over one year to construct. The mammoth structure compared in this publicity photo to the American Falls was large enough to accommodate seven football fields. Or as shown in this early animation, the entire Washington Capitol building. The excitement of the air dock construction was a fitting backdrop as Goodyear produced four additional public relations blimps. The Puritan, the Vigilant, the Mayflower, and the Volunteer, all named for winners of the America's Cup, were christened. As Litchfield continued to hold tight his dream of airships sailing the skies as yachts sailed the seas. The Goodyear blimp fleet seemed to be everywhere, keeping a watchful eye on the U.S. Capitol building and paying a visit to Lady Liberty. And it was another lady of the day, popular movie beauty Jeanette McDonald, who chose the volunteer to deliver her latest feature, The Vagabond King, as she waited amid producers and directors on a Hollywood rooftop. Elsewhere in California, the volunteer acted as a newsboy, delivering a special 20th anniversary edition of the Los Angeles Times, while the Puritan delivered a special edition to the Empire State Building, all for perfect landings setting the stage for other stunts starring Goodyear's lighter-than-air celebrities. Now, I'm going to hook this on in here, and you take me up to about 1,500 feet, and uh, wave to me when, they get, when we get that altitude, and I'll cut loose, go off the dive and recover. From amateurs to pros, the aviators were soaring right along with Goodyear. In 1929, Amelia Earhart christened the Defender, Goodyear's flagship of the fleet. Largest of the public relations blimps of the day, the Defender could reach a top speed of 62 miles per hour. It was the first of Goodyear's blimps to bear a night sign, a neon Goodyear that would later be dubbed the Neonogram and equipped on other Goodyear craft. According to a company spokesperson of the day, the primary mission of the Goodyear blimp fleet was to make the American public airship conscious. While the airplane had become by then a common sight, the only lighter than aircraft were the Army and Navy airships, rarely seen by the public and then at a distance. The Goodyear blimps could come down out of the sky and mix with the people of America. And quite a mix it was. From 1925 to 1941, sometimes flying several in formation, the Goodyear blimp fleet made over 150,000 flights and traveled over 4 million miles just for the fun of it. In the meantime, Goodyear, the name emblazoned on the monumental air dock, was building two of the world's largest airships, aimed for war instead of wonder. Thousands watched as Goodyear put together the pieces and the power of a flying giant, watching as the skeleton began to take form from the main frame of this rigid airship through the intricate latticework of the Duralum and girders, giving the lady her not-so-dainty shape. Hundreds of men coming from surrounding states were needed in the air dock, working above, below, and inside the structure. When we would get letters from my dad, we were all so excited about it because we thought from Tuckasegee, North Carolina to Akron, Ohio was miles, it was like going to the moon to us. He would write and tell about the Goodyear hangar and how big it was and um, all the hard work and how high he had to climb in this big hangar. And as children, we were so excited about this. We could hardly wait for the next letter to come. 
The enthusiasm continued through the two-year production of the 758-foot craft. Six and a half million rivets were needed to hold the ship together before she could be freed in the skies. Covering the ship's metal skeleton took seven acres of cotton fabric, waterproof with a sparkling aluminized finish. She certainly looked fit and well in shape for her important introduction. They do things in a big way out here. This mammoth Zeppelin dock in Akron, which we see from the air, houses the new queen of the skies. And everybody from miles around is coming to see the Navy's giant Zepp. There's standing room only inside as the crowd gazes on the silver sky battleship. There's Mrs. Hoover approaching the stand now. She's come to christen the ship, and the crowd gives her a big hand. It's quite an idea. The first lady of the land, naming the first lady of the skies. I name thee Aqua. Forty-eight pigeons, one for each state in the Union, guide the way out of the air dock as the USS Akron, the mightiest craft of its time, is unveiled on August 8, 1931. Designed to hold over six and a half million cubic feet of helium, 30 times greater than that of today's blimps, the Akron was able to carry up to 91 passengers and crew members and contain sleeping quarters, a mess hall, galley, and restrooms. It took hours and hours, but no one became impatient. They were too, uh, too willing to anticipate the thrill of seeing that monster come out of the hangar and then eventually take off. There she goes, clear of the mooring mast on her first venture into Cloudland. The motors are merely idling now because her actual top speed is more than 80 miles an hour. The cruising radius of this aerial giant is 11,500 miles, a distance equal to halfway around the world. What a thrilling picture the great ship makes as she floats majestically through space. It's a sight no one will ever forget. Long may she cruise as a symbol of America's air power. And so she did, at least for a while. Flying proudly over Washington, D.C. and New York City, the Akron debuted as the first Goodyear-built rigid Navy airship. In the following year, 1932, the Akron's trapeze, or air hook, would be put to use as pilots mastered the tricky task of landing on the hook designed for the Akron and her sister ship, the Macon. The airships Akron and Macon were, were basically designed for a military role as a, uh, a platform uh, for scouting, uh, not only the scouting by the airship, but also by the uh, aircraft that it carried. But the Navy would have to look to other resources as the Akron would take her final flight on April 3, 1933. While attempting to uh, probe uh, some thunderstorms and demonstrate the capabilities of the airship, uh, while Admiral Moffat was aboard, uh, it was lost in a line squall. The country mourned the loss of its beloved Akron, yet looked with hope and with promise to her sister ship, the USS Macon. The Macon was christened by Admiral Moffat's wife only weeks before the Akron disaster. I remember the vast crowd. I remember the sight of the airship, uh, the air dock, and it was a tremendous experience. It felt like it was on top of me. I mean, you could see the people in it waving at you. It was pretty low. I, uh, I couldn't estimate the uh, height because uh, of the size of the airship. It was thrilling to have them fly right over my house. The Macon also caused a thrill for those attending the 1933 Century of Progress World's Fair. Traveling to Chicago along with the Puritan, the Macon captivated the interest of visitors from around the world who came to see the latest and the greatest innovations for land, sea, and sky. The possibility seemed endless until February of 1935 when a fog over the Pacific dimmed the path and the future of the Macon on its way, quite ironically, to Sunnyvale, California. An intense rainstorm developed, damaging the craft's top tail fin and forcing the ship to land at sea. The loss of the Macon signaled the end of rigid airship development at Goodyear, but the PR blimps continued to pull their weight, and then some. 
During the remainder of the 1930s, blimps were used in active duty, delivering parachuters and public attention, and making special pickups, like this one of Paul Litchfield from a cruise ship in the New York Harbor. It was good preparation for the call to action addressed a few years later. But since the unprovoked and dastardly attack on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war. As the word of war sounded, all branches of the military began to build up their arsenals of personnel and equipment. Goodyear public relations blimps would serve as the prototypes for the naval blimp fleet used in World War II as they were placed in military service, repainted and used as blimp trainers for new pilots. As the war continued, more lighter than aircraft were ordered by the military, and Goodyear delivered, building the Navy's blimp fleet at a frenzy rate. As a engine mechanic, why we would uh, go into the uh, test stand that they had in at Plant B, uh, where the cars were all assembled, and we would uh, put fuel in the tanks and run the engines and make sure all the systems were working. And we just take the propellers off, they put them on a flatbed truck and bring them out here, uh, put them underneath the envelope, and within a week, that airship was in the air. Most of the vessels were used as submarine spotters, patrolling the east and west coasts, their mere presence enough to keep the enemy at bay. Their charge was to be the search half of the war's search and destroy missions, alerting our coastal defenses when enemy subs were spotted from the sky. Throughout World War II, Goodyear provided over 150 blips and over 1,000 tethered barrage and free-flying training balloons for Uncle Sam as well as the Allies. After the war, Goodyear took steps to resume its public relations fleet operations, buying back the components of seven ships from the War Assets Administration. These blimps were used to trail banners for various events and for a short time were chartered to various companies like Canada Dry and Mobile Oil. However, this duty was short-lived as the emphasis for the Goodyear blimps returned to only promoting the company's name and products. In 1947, Goodyear developed a 10-panel incandescent night sign to replace the neonogram and flashing the message, Goodyear means good wear. Mr. Litchfield would have been pleased. Although his dream of transoceanic airship travel was lost, it gave way to a new era in which the Goodyear blimps would soar. The 1960s saw more ships added to the Goodyear promotional fleet like the Columbia, a ship christened, well, almost christened by Jacqueline Mayer, a recently crowned Miss America. Her failure to break the bottle did not break the spirits of a company who found a unique way to crack the brave new world of the 1960s. Changing attitudes and changing channels presented Goodyear with a unique platform to change the way the world looked from the top down. The first network television, I believe, was in 63, the Orange Bowl, done by a CBS producer called Frank Trichinian, and it's really taken off since there. Skyrocketed, to be more accurate. Since 1963, Goodyear has covered over 2,500 live network televised events, from the Rose Bowl to the Brickyard 400, the U.S. Open to World Series Baseball. First of all, the cameras were very, very heavy, the microwave equipment. Uh, the unions at that time required two guys to be in there. So, I mean, we had to and literally ask for skinny people because we were using all our lift with these heavy heavy cameras. Besides being thin, they also had to be steady because at one time, blimp photography was done by hanging the camera out the side of the gondola window. It, it very much looked like the most amateurish video, but you could see that there was this great overall picture of an event. No one had ever seen the Rose Bowl with 106,000 people. No one had ever seen the Orange Bowl. But today, the camera Goodyear uses and help design is less than half the weight, with a lens offering 55 times the intensity of anything ever before. Here's how it works. A microwave transmitter sends a camera signal to the ground dish antenna, which is attached to the network's control truck. The blimp pilot listens for cues from the show's director for the best live shot. Richard, can you swing over and shoot the downtown building? So you, you're almost right over, actually, but, uh, 10 seconds. A little downtown action. Yeah, sure. 
Some more BP building and stuff? Sure. Three, two, coming back. And we are back and live. Bartolo Colon works out of his first gym of the afternoon. The Indians hoping to get something going. Uh, the producer, director, and technical manager will have direct access to the pilot and the camera person aboard the airship and uh, just goes from there. If it's four days of golf, then you're in the air six to eight hours a day for four days. If it's one football game, you're doing a three and a half hour left-hand turn around some stadium, and it can be anything from a beauty shot uh, coming out of or going into a commercial uh, down to uh, live play action shots or replays because of the long lens we're using. Using Goodyear's state-of-the-art gyrocam, Goodyear blimps cover about 120 events a year giving the world the best seat in the house for line drives and lakefronts, rushing, and racing. Goodyear operates three U.S. blimps, all able to cover television events from coast to coast. Under normal conditions, the Goodyear blimp, traveling at about 35 miles per hour and at a 1,500-foot altitude, has a life of its own in the air. Its movements are slow and ponderous, yet it reacts very intimately to air currents and thermals. Flying in Chicago is difficult. I mean, I remember many times where a, uh, a director or a producer would ask me when the blimp is getting here, and I said, hey, it's going two miles an hour. The wind has come up, but we will get here. Uh, sometimes, we've, you know, sometimes we've even flown backwards in Chicago because it's so windy. So just how difficult to fly are these big gas bags? Gears and pulleys are operated by muscle power for rudder control. On the elevator wheel, the same design innovation as on the Pilgrim helps with elevator control. The older style airship, uh, which hasn't changed since 1932, that pilot's uh, seat was designed in 1932 and it's the same. We've got rudder pedals that you use your legs on. The force on the rudder pedals can reach as high as three or 400 pounds pressure that you need to uh, give a full deflection uh, right or left. And there are times when you have to do that. Uh, and so most of the pilots have very strong legs. Over the years, Goodyear has trained over 100 pilots and countless other associates as each blimp in the fleet travels with four pilots, assisted by riggers, engine mechanics, electronic technicians, ground handlers, and a public relations manager. Uh, you see the blimp and there it is by itself. Occasionally they'll mention the pilot, occasionally they'll mention the camera person, but there's a lot of support activity that goes on behind the scenes to keep that one blimp up in the air over the stadium. Uh, literally, engineering staff, uh, rigging and maintenance people, crews. There's uh, 20 people waiting at the airport for every blimp that's over a stadium. Here's a condensed look at a very expansive operation. First, ballast bags filled with 25 pounds of lead shot are adjusted to bring the helium-filled blimp to the desired takeoff weight. Most pilots like to take off about four bags down or 100 pounds heavy. During this operation, ground crew members hold the blimp down with ropes connected to the ship's nose cone and gondola railing. The nose lines are used to hold the ship's nose into the wind while it's being handled on the ground. As the blimp rises, the helium in the envelope expands, increasing the internal air pressure. The ballonets, or airbags inside the blimp, are deflated to compensate. The higher the blimp rises, the more air that must be released. During descent, the envelope pressure drops and the air-filled ballonets are reinflated to keep the pressure in the bag constant relative to the outside air pressure. To accomplish this, air scoops behind the engines funnel the air pushed by the propellers into the ballonets. Landing, members of the ground crew grab the two ropes attached to the nose in order to secure the blimp. Once it's close enough to the ground, other members grab the railings on either side of the gondola. Then the blimp is docked to a portable mooring mast. The blimp is anchored to the earth only at this one point, so it's always free to rotate 360 degrees around the mast as the wind changes. It will always point itself toward the wind, just like a giant weather vane, ready for takeoff, even when it's off duty. But with its frantic schedule and even more frantic fanfare, the Goodyear blimps have little reason for rest. 60% of their time is spent on television coverage and another 10% on travel as they're routinely scheduled for national tours from May through October. Their remaining hours are filled trying to accommodate the many requests for special appearances, special promotions, and special favors for those wanting to experience the lighter-than-air ride. 
The hardest job we have is to turn people down that want to go for a ride. We'd like to see everybody go, but when you're carrying four, five, six at a time, it just doesn't work out for you. In the evening, we try to set aside a couple of hours within our eight-hour day to fly public service messages, to let people know what's going on with uh, local charities and events, in addition to our own product messages and some national events. Even though Goodyear's public relations service through night messaging was established years ago, it was the Skytacular, Goodyear's right-to-left night messaging system installed on the Mayflower in 1966 that really lit the public's interest. No one had seen or done anything like it. With each side of the ship carrying over 1,500 lights, the Skytacular could flash messages and animation in red, yellow, green, and blue, telling us what to do, where to go, and, of course, what to buy. A few years later, technology, as well as the need to be a little bit bigger, better, and bolder, drove Goodyear to expand their night messaging system and the size of their airships. The Columbia could carry the Super Skytacular, named for having twice as many lights and three times the amount of wiring. Released from the left-to-right design constraint, the technician used a light pen to create magnetically red images flashed on a 105-foot-long, 24-and-a-half-foot-high lighted billboard. For the next several decades, this type of night messaging system was used by Goodyear to delight viewers with their whimsical animation and uplifting words. On a more serious mission in August 1992, the Goodyear Stars and Stripes used its super spectacular brilliance to be a sign of hope to South Central Florida. And Hurricane Andrew hit Florida, and that's our home. And uh, aside from a lot of anxious moments with our people on the crew that wanted to get home to find out what was going on, uh, the governor of Florida called our chairman at the time. And instead of proceeding to Dallas, we made a left turn at Louisville. And uh, they made it home in record time. And our job at that point was to combine what we ordinarily do as public service with messages, giving disaster and relief messages to places that had no communications. They were completely cut off from any communications. The, the, there wasn't any power, and the, most of them had lost everything that they had. They, were, they didn't even have any little portable radios or anything like that for anybody to get the messages out to them, where they could get help and where they could find things, because that area was just devastated. These people had to be taken care of. They couldn't speak English, so what could they do? Well, they came to Goodyear. And we, we put out a night sign with Creole for the, for the Haitian people, uh, Spanish and a, a Cuban message, uh, English on there. And we flew it all around the area, what they needed to do in terms of preventing typhus, where you could get help. Survivors were directed to water, food, and shelter. Survivors who had nowhere but up to look for help. That kind of public service has always been an underlying mission of these great ships of the sky. Yet creating these messages was a time-consuming task. When I joined the company, the nighttime technology was a series of incandescent lamps that had colored lenses, driven by electronics that was designed back in the 1960s, mid-1960s. Uh, the electronic boxes were four boxes that carried on the airship, and weighed about 90 pounds a piece. And so we had a lot of weight to carry and we couldn't do anything else but night sign. We had to, to create night signs frame by frame. Each frame was 1 15th of a second and you had to hand draw each one similar to what a cartoonist would do. Until the development of more advanced night sign technology, like that found on the new Stars and Stripes, where night sign messaging has taken another quantum leap forward. Basically we can take a scanner, scan in any kind of logo or picture or anything like that, and using uh, graphic manipulation programs, turn it into something we can play on the night side. And now we use a little integrated circuit board that has three colored LEDs on board. They're red, green, and blue. Very high brightness, and with the color mixing of the three colors, we can get any color of the rainbow that we want. Uh, before we were stuck, with four colors, which were just yellow, blue, green, and red. Now we can get all the colors in between and different brightnesses so we can get much better textured pictures. 
Since put into public relations service, Goodyear has had nearly 40 blimps in their public relations fleet. Blimps, classified as non-rigid because of their lack of internal girders to give shape to the inflated bag of gas. Blimps that appear to be made of steel, yet are spun of polyester and are lighter than air. Blimps that fly a dozen years of service and create a lifetime of memories. Blimps worth an estimated five million dollars each that will never be put up for sale. Their flights of fancy have created a priceless legacy for the company that allows them to bear its good name. I had a little child uh, ask his dad, he says, do we have uh, blimp tires on our car? And uh, after looking at the blimp and everything, I walked out with his dad and, uh, and this little boy, and he, his son knelt down next to his dad's tires and looked at the logo on the tires. And he couldn't read, but he could see that his dad had Goodyear tires on the, because he could recognize the logo on the, on the side of the tires. Uh, in an old truck, and she had forgotten about it, but she found several of dad's old letters, um, a lot of the old magazines, the alert magazines that dad had sent home. and. Um, his uniform with a Goodyear emblem on the back. And so all these things were wonderful. So the blimp really to me is representative uh, of wonderful memories and then lots of sentimental memories certainly as well. I think over the years the blimp has been elevated, at least the Goodyear blimp, to, uh, uh, it's, it's a tired old saying, but when you're talking about uh, motherhood and apple pie and all the things that are American, I think we were lucky enough or maybe our folks were good enough and careful enough about protecting our name to get us in that category. And our big job now is to keep us in that category. Claiming this century through service, frolic, and certainly their grace, Goodyear blimps have accomplished what few have only dreamt. They have given us a thrill. They have left us with hope that this familiar friendly icon floating faithfully above our towns will forever set sail in our imaginations and inspire our spirit of adventure, prompting us to leave our earthbound cares behind and look up with the wondering eyes of a child above and beyond what we ever thought possible.